Okay, let's start, uh, because you have a lot of material to cover. Um, my name is Mateusz Pusz, I'm Chief Software Engineer and the Head of C++ Competency Center at IPAM Systems. I'm also a C++ Trainer, Consultant and the member of the ISO C++ Committee. I'm working on C++ standardization for the last two years. And basically I was, yeah, I was there where, when we were working on C++ 17. And this is the subject of today's talk. We will be talking about the uh, proposals, changes that were accepted for C++ 17. This is also the part two of my talk because the first part was last year. So today we will not cover that material. We'll, if you want to see it, it will, there is a video on YouTube from last year. We'll just highlight like three or four of the most important features that we uh, described last year. So let's start. Uh, what has moved for last year? Last year we met somewhere here in 2018. For last year, we finished ranges and merged them to the standard. We finished modules, we finished coroutines, and everything of this was, was, was merged to the C20 already. We also finished work on reflection TS, but this is TS. It will not be part of C20. We expect it to be part of C23. Our committee grown for last year. From, from, from a lot of groups were added, a lot, four of them. Um, we have so many papers and so many activity uh, on, on our meetings that we had to pro produce new uh, study groups called incubators that will be first step of, of verification, validation of papers for evolution uh, uh, groups for both core and library parts of the standard uh, committee. Uh, well, there are also new study groups created for machine learning and for education, SG19 and SG20. First of all, uh, there was a lot of stuff that happened for last year. I think, in, personally, that C++20 will be much bigger than C++11 was. And, and it's huge comparing to 14 and 17. So, so there is a lot of material to cover. We'll not be able to cover in part two everything that we didn't cover in part one, unfortunately. I had to skip some stuff and I had to treat some stuff just with, as a, uh, roughly, not, not with specific detail because I cannot teach you uh, ranges, concepts, modules in 90 minutes. Yes, it's just not, not possible. Uh, so if you would be interested in, in, in a specific subject, please refer to talk dedicated to this subject. And also you can study the proposal paper because all of the changes that I'm providing here always or nearly always will have the um, proposal number that you can easily find with this tool WG21 link. And then after slash you provide the paper number and you always find the latest version of it. If you want to find specific revision, you provide R and the number. So let's quickly recap what was in part one. In part one, we were talking about constra constraints and concepts. So we talk about the, that, that we can create concepts that have some, some requirements for the types provided to it. Then for this, you can use requires clause. That will say, for example, here that A and, assuming that you have A and B of type T, you can equally compare them. And the result of it should produce something that's, that passes Boolean concept. You can then use this concept in requires clause in template function, for example, here. And with that, you will have a pretty nice error saying that, that if you would like, for example, to pass a mutex here, that's basically not equally comparable, then you will have a nice error instead of some really nested deep dive in the, in the implementation of this template function uh, error saying that something is wrong. With concepts, it's pretty simple. And the valid verification is being done before function instantiation, and it's part of the interface. So you don't have to go, go with the implementation. You, you, the, only the declaration or, or signature of the function is enough to know what, are, what is the contract. Let's say this is concept, but let's say contract of this function when we are talking about the types that are accepted by this function template. We're also talking about the Starship operator. So those all paper numbers were uh, the source for the consistent comparison. Assuming you have class P with members X and Y, just to provide it, to make it uh, a good regular type 
with, with, with comparison operators, you have to provide all of those, and all of those are uh, pretty uh, easy to write, and that's why we are doing a lot of errors there, because of copy-paste problems we do. This is too easy, we don't think about them too much, and I've seen a lot of problems, copy-paste errors in such code. With Starship operator, we are writing only one function, equals default, it's a freeway comparison, so it means that it, it behaves similar to what we know from the string compare or, or mem compare. So if something is, is equal when it's returns zero, and you can have less and bigger than zero return to know if it's less or greater. Um, if you provide the default here, it will generate a function with member-wise semantics. So that x will be compared and then y's will be compared. And it's commonly known as a spaceship operator because of this like signature here, these this characters. Um, for example, let's have another example here, so saying we have like case insensitive string or another string. We, for simplicity, we're just using string here as implementation because it's not important here in this slide. The important stuff that we would like to compare not only our, our type with our type, but also with, for example, contrast star, and we have to compare it on the right side and on the left side. And we have even more functions to type every time for such types. With Starship, we can write it this way, that we can say that it's a um, and this, this makes the comparison with the same type, this makes it with the, with the chart star, and this makes it the comparison on the left and the right side of, 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 the, of the comparison operator. And you don't have to write default, you can provide your own implementation, and that's fine. You can also provide exactly what type of ordering is expected for such a type. So, um, if for the same values of a and b, f of a and always equals f of b, then we have strong ordering or equality, if you have only equality not less than comparison. Otherwise, we are having weak ordering and weak, or the weak, weak equality here. So this is like a short recap of, the, of what we talked like last year. Another really important feature, one of the best stuff I ever seen in the standard library, is chrono. And chrono is being extended with, with, with date right now. We are using date in our company for production for, for many years right now. It's written by Howard Hinnant. You can find the implementation of it on his GitHub. It's really good quality implementation, great library. I recommend you using it right now. Don't wait for C20 to come. It provides support for, for calendars and time zones. Uh, it uses time zones through the IANA time zone database, which basically provides you all the time zones from the beginning of the human history. And does it everything besides the time zone stuff, does calendar stuff in compile time. So for example, if you would like to specify uh, the date, 2016, May 29th, you can specify it this way, this way, or this way. You can say this is the fifth Sunday of May. And it works in compile time. This is consexp. Uh, date really easily connects to what we have in chrono right now, so you can create date that will it convert it to time point. And then you can verify that time point will, in compile time is exactly this amount of seconds. And you can, of course, go back from the time point to date. And here we have uh, creation of the time point from date and time from chrono. And then but put, put, putting it to the time zone in, in, in Tokyo. This is, as I said, runtime stuff for time zones. We also talked about span a year ago. Span is like a string view, but for, for, for any data type. It, it's so, so basically, it's a view. It's not a container. It doesn't, it doesn't contain the, 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 the objects. And uh, it's like a reference to, to, to something that's already somewhere. And it has to live longer than the span if you would like to use the span without any issues. And it never performs any free store allocations. So basically it's pretty really fast and it's really small. So it's also recommended to pass it by value. Uh, if you want to learn more about those, those stuff or see more stuff that we discussed last year, I recommend you going to, to my talk from the last year. And let's move to the part two. I'm not John Lakos. I am not able to, to deliver you 200 slides in one hour. 
So right now it's your turn and it's up to you to vote which part of the talk you would like to hear today. We can either scope on the big and famous features that you maybe know already from other talks or from some blogs, or we can scope on the features that are not that well known, but, but important and meaningful for C++20. So right now, let's vote which, which version you would like to see. Is it Jeff? Yes. Uh, one thing that might change your vote, uh, I have a presentation on Tuesday of all the non-ranges C++20 library things. So there's an overlap with your presentation, but not totally. Mm -hmm. And I also have a ranges presentation on Wednesday for an hour and a half. So that might choose how people want to see what you're going to present. Yeah, so the comment from the audience was that we'll have a ranges talk dedicated here. I also have a really nice, long 90-minute talk on meeting C++ that you can find on the ranges. But if you want to hear about ranges today and now, vote on the option, option A, yes? So who is for option A? One, two, three, four, five. Uh, option B? Okay, <laughs> let's go with option B then. Uh, how it works, like this, okay. So let's go with option B, this, the less advertised goods, uh, good stuff. It's still 100 slides. I'm not sure if I will be able to, to deliver all of this. <laughs> and I cut some parts of it because I, I, didn't, I, I thought that I would be able to provide you all of this stuff, but I have like 400 slides on all the C++ 20 already. As I said, I'm a C++ trainer. I'm doing notes in terms of slides. So I have slides for everything. So the slides include both A and B? Yes. I will provide slides with, with both options. But probably I will maybe deliver the same talk with option A on another conference. <laughs> okay, so in my opinion, one of the biggest features after those big stuff on option A is class types and non-type template parameters. Uh, this feature will totally reinvent stuff, how we think and how we implement template metaprogramming stuff. Um, more details about this we'll hear tomorrow on my talk about the physical units library, but basically some highlights can be, will be provided today. Basically, right now, uh, we could provide non-type template parameters of types like integer, enumeration. Also, we could use like reference and pointer, which was pretty uh, hardcore stuff and not recommended to everyone because, yeah, it's pretty strange. But right now, we'll be able to pass simple classes there. What I mean by simple classes? It, ha it, doesn't, it cannot be union and it has to have strong structural equality, which meant with when the paper was standardized, that it has to have provide a defaulted operator starship with strong equality. It was changed lately by P1185. Uh, the, the definition of strong equality right now means that we're having a new uh, equality comparator with equals default to. So basically, starship operator has, has performance issues for, for example, containers. So we'll be able to write also uh, equal Operator equals equals default, which will provide the equality in binary way, not not, not freeway, which has which has better performance. So this is the requirement for the types in order to be used for non-type template parameters. So for example, we can right now uh, use chronoseconds as a template parameter instead of just size t seconds, for example. We can have fixed string, and instantiate the template this way instead of doing it this way. You can also create a UDL that will be working with fixed string as a template parameter. User defined literal, yes. Uh, talking about my uh, domain here from the use library, um, imagine that you have ratio right now, it's a type in the chrono, yes? And you have to do ratio divide for some operator divide for two quantities. This ratio divide does a lot of template instantiations. It calculates greatest common division and so on for, 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 for nominator denominator of the, of the ratio. With C20, we'll be able to write it this way if ratio will be value type instead of, instead of the type. So non-type type parameter. So this ratio is a stud chrono ratio. This ratio is a simple structure having two integers inside. And you can just make an operator here, and there are no template instantiations connected to, to that. This is where performance boost comes. Also, 
you, you can see here that I still have dimension divide. I'm still thinking if it's possible, but if it will be, this, this, will, be, this will be looking like this. That also dimensions will be divided. Dimensions basically in my implementation contains type lists, or in this case, non-type lists. And if it could be just values, with, for example, compile time vector, it would also save a lot of performance, a lot of template instantiations being done for, for, for this library. Another really important feature for every one of us is that uh, we broke aggregates in C++11, and right now we are trying to fix them. Uh, right now, aggregate initialization says that uh, that cannot have user-provided, inherited, or explicit constructors, but you can say const provide constructor that is, for example, equals delete or equals default. Um, yeah. Mm, okay. So uh, this co this class is not a default construct table. So you cannot write it this way, but you can write it this way. Fargate initialization, yes? If you provide this all the way with private implementation or private implementation equals default, it's still not default constructable, but you still can initialize it this way. But this time it compiles because it has equals default. Yeah, it compiles in both cases, actually, yeah. And Another case, we have integer with default value 4 here, with defaulted default constructor. You cannot write it this way, because this is default constructor, not the constructor taking a value, but you can write it this way. Similar, if you will have this constructor with value deleted. You cannot initialize it with a value, because it's a deleted constructor, but you can initialize it with aggregate initialization. This also compiles fine. This doesn't compile. But you provide the default outside of the class. So basically, aggregates are broken right now, and you are trying to fix them. But it, this, this, this is, uh, yeah, this has some problems with, with backward compatibility. Yes, question? I think that both of the, um, uh, the question is which of those uh, examples are bad. I think that all of those examples are bad. Yes, so I'm showing you in many different ways how you can write a type that is broken with aggregate initialization. Maybe if you know exactly details of, of C++ initializations and there are only a few guys knowing this by heart in the world, then you probably know this is obvious, yes? But for many users, it's not obvious that just changing the, the braces type, uh, the, the, com the code compiles or not. Mm. It should behave the same. It should be consistent. So basically, what changes is that right now aggregate will uh, will be not, will not aggregates will not have any uh, constructors, even user declared ones. User declared means equals default. And with that, um, basically, everything will. Uh, all of this will fail too for uh, for uh, for initialization. This will not be treated as an aggregate. So basically, this will be false. Oh, oh this is not. I, I had the static assert saying is is aggregate. As is aggregate will will be fail for for this case. <coughs> Another case where aggregates are different from from. Typical structures is if you have, for example, structure having uh, two arguments in the constructor or just an aggregate, you can initialize the first case in with both type of braces, but in second case, you cannot provide both type of braces right now because you cannot initialize the aggregate with, with curly braces. So P0960 basically provides us the support in order for us to be able to initialize aggregates with with curly braces, which unifies the way of initialization, and right now probably the curly braces will be the sub suggested way of initialization of all of the types in your system. But of course, everything has some 
uh, exceptions. So basically, it will not be exactly the same. For example, if you write A with curly braces, mm, there, will, there will be conversions when, when, when the aggregatization will not convert between, between types. So, so things like, like the narrowing conversions and so on. Here also is about narrowing conversions. Uh, Here is about the derived types, sorry. And also there is a feature that, you, that if you have an aggregate that has an um, error value reference here, that it um, extends the lifetime of bound object in aggregate initialization. With curly braces it will not work. But those are some corner cases of initialization that, that probably we are, we are not using or we are even not aware of them. That you can pass here uh, the result of f, that is an int, and this lifetime of it will be extended in this case, in this case will not. But probably in most cases it's not just the good way to, to write this code like this. I would prefer value semantics rather than R value semantics and then it's easy to reason about the lifetime. And following the today's talk from the keynote, context for all the things. In C++11, we have a list. You can do that many stuff in context. context. In C++14, we had the same long list of things that you cannot do in C++14 context. context. Right now, this list is like this. It shrinks. We removed a lot of restrictions. We allowed a lot, of, a, lot, a, lot of, a lot more of code to be used in compile time evaluation context. One of those are virtual function calls that will be possible to, to, to use context in those cases. As we've heard today in the, in the keynote, we can mix those. Uh, so you can have a base class that has a context and have an inherited class that doesn't have context for the same, uh, for the same virtual function or vice versa. And if you have different overrides that are having concepts or not, they will be that it will be determined if it's a concept exp expression in, in, the, in, in the meantime. So it's possible to write the code like this. Also what changed is right now we'll be able to change the union member for a context code here. So if you have a union of integer and float, you will be able to change the union type in context function. Right now it was not allowed. We'll be able to write excep exceptions in class code. As long as exceptions, of course, are not from there. Uh, this is the no, op no operation for constant, constant expression. But basically, it will not trigger compile time error for us. So you can write the code like this, and it will be fine in C20. And then basically, exceptions will be handled only if the cost function is being run with in the runtime context rather than compile time stuff. In compile time, you cannot throw exceptions. It's still on the short list. Also, we'll be able to do dynamic casts and type ID in context with C20. Uh, it was possible earlier, but we didn't have a good motivating example for this. A uh, good motivating example is ABI breaks. We hate ABIs in C++ committee, but it seems that users love it. Uh, like the ABI compatibility between versions, between compilers that they compiled his, their library like 20 years ago and they expect still to link it properly with, with, their, with, 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 the, with the latest version of the compiler. And I, I think personally that's bad. I would prefer us to, to, to like break ABI with every release and, and just force everyone to, to recompile the libraries to, to, to a new release if they want to move to a new compiler, to a new compiler version or a new standard version or just stay in the old one. Because for example, if you would like to extend error category with new stuff and we have like at least three papers that suggest adding new stuff there, we are changing ABI of error category. So we cannot add members, we cannot add new virtual functions because all of this changes the ABI of, of, of the type that we already standardized. We cannot move, we cannot progress, we cannot change. It's not change, it's adding new stuff, but in the way that API, uh, that the code will still compile, but will not link properly. So the motivating example is, that we can think that about creating error category version 2 that will inherit from, from error category. 
and then you can use dynamic cast uh, in the constant compare time context to verify with which version of every category we are working and behave accordingly, which is broken design and it's really nasty, but it makes ABI happy. And this is what we are forced to do if you want to progress with keeping what users are used to with ABI. That's why I would really recommend reconsidering ABI stability. And if it's really that needed, if you'd like to have design like this from the committee, just to stay with ABI that was valid like 10 years ago. Because this is nasty. Yes, Arthur? And I guess for this, maybe you also need the is constant evaluated thing also. Otherwise, every single time I construct an error code, I do a dynamic cast. Doesn't seem like that plays very well together. Yeah, the comment from Arthur was that we can use the is constant evaluated stuff that we've heard like an hour ago on the keynote. Yes, it could help here, but anyway, it's still broken. <laughs> it doesn't change, it's, it's still broken, and I wouldn't really like to, to standardize that stuff, only to, to, prevent, to, to, to preserve the ABI stability for the users. Um, you also added context to, to many places in the standard library, for example, to pointer, pointer traits, uh, actually to pointer traits of um, specialization for pointer types only. So there, there is a context here for pointer too, and this allows us to write the compare time vector. It was, about, it was meant to, to be in C++20, but we just learned that it will not be in C++20, probably 23, but we are really close to doing it. It's limited only to partial specialization, because otherwise, if you would do in the primary template, that it will affect all of these specializations, even for the one that users wrote. So it will be having much bigger scope. And right now, it will affect only users that will, will have their own specializations for their own pointer, pointer types. Not generic T, but like user type pointer. If, if, you have, you, if you're having specializations for it, you will have to add context there too. Also, we added context to many places that were missing, to per, tuple, array, card traits, basic string view, default searcher, back inserters, uh, yeah, and insert iterators. So a lot more context in the standard library. We also found out that we can do things like find and, and do sort with comp comp in compile time context. <coughs> so right now, we cannot do find on const time, compile time std array. And with C20, we'll be able to do it. And it affected all of those algorithms. So right now, we are able to, to do swap ranges, iter swap, reverse, rotate, partition, sort, partial sort, end element, heaps, and permutations, and of course, swap in compile time. So with that, we have also changed to std array sort, uh, sorry, equality comp comparison, which was using lexicography compare also to, to use concepts. So as you can see, a lot of new stuff, a lot of things will be possible to use a context per evaluation context with C20. Immediate functions. So const eval that you've heard on the keynote today. So maybe I will not I, I removed a few slides during the keynote because it was pretty nice described there. Mm, they're basically the functions that are guaranteed to run at compile time. If we will try to run a function with, with um, runtime arguments, you'll have a compile time error. So it's basically like template metaprogramming in old boost MPL. You cannot run it with, 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 with runtime variables, yes? This is called an immediate function. It's written with const eval keyword. And basically you can run this, this way, but if you would like, would like to run it with, with runtime variable, you have a compile time error saying that this can be run only in compile time context. As we've heard, those functions will never appear in our binary code. They are only for compile time. So you, for example, will not be able to take a pointer to, this, to those functions because they do not exist in the final binary code. And this is basically meant to be a basic building block for, for reflections and meta classes, but I also feel that it would be really useful for me, for example, for my physical units library. Question. Yes? Um, is it allowed to override an existing function with a const eval version of, of that function, which is completely identical, except for the fact that it's const eval? 
can we overwrite, like, like overload the same function? Yes, overload uh, with having a regular function and and com and uh, const eval. And uh, not, I, I don't think so. But you can rename it like like the function compile time, and you can reuse the implementation of const function in const eval function. So you don't have to reimplement twice, but you have to have two different separate names. That's at least my understanding of it. Because we've heard today that we can use context functions in const eval functions. So you have one implementation, but, but, but two names. Yes, Artur? Questions which I think were essentially the same thing about overloading. You, you said you can't take the address of SQR here. Yes. But if I had two different functions named SQR with different signatures, and one of them happened to be this magic const eval where I can't take the address, then when I make the overload set, pass that to the function and say, give me the address of whichever square is appropriate, uh, then that would, like, one of them would quietly drop out. The yeah. Would say, yeah. The question is about the overloading of, of, of those. If if you have two functions, one is const eval, another one is regular one, having different arguments, so basically this is an overload set, how we pass this overload to a function, to a template? I don't know. If you know how to pass an overload set, to, to, to a function template, I would really like to know because we are thinking in LEWG for this for many years. We still don't have the support in the language to pass overload sets. We can pass only a function. And the function will be selected based on the arguments. But if the function is selected, is the const eval one, it's going to be either ill-formed or it's going to quietly go away or something? No, it will compile an error saying that, that you are trying to use a function with, with runtime arguments that is conceivo. It will, it will not be able to just use it, yes? You cannot pass an overload set to a function, but I would really love to have this feature in the language. This is something that we pray for C++23. Titus Winters talks a lot about this on his, in his talks. Go and see, see them. Are, this is really important for us to move to, to this point where we'll be talking about overload sets instead of functions in templates. It changes a lot. Another cool feature for library implementers are, is explicit of bool. It's an operator right now. So for example, if you have a pair of two strings, you would like to initialize it that way, because it's pretty simple and straightforward. But con consider implementing two stud in, in, if you have a pair of stud two std vectors of int, and you would like to initialize it with this constructor, which basically sets the size of both vectors, it's not straightforward, yes? You, you don't want this code to, to compile fine. So in order to implement those two behaviors in one std per primary template, you have to write something like this. We basically have to have to the same constructor with the same implementation provided twice with different set of overload of, of basically uh, Sfinale stuff. So we have here the same arguments, but the, 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 the same two second lines are inverted in both cases. So if something is convertible from u to t, then we can have non-explicit constructor. If it's not convertible, you have to have explicit constructor. So a lot of typing, uh, a lot of retyping of the same function inside, and basically no one besides standard library or booths are doing this in their own user company code because it's too much of effort. With concept, it's, a, it's pretty easier because you can, instead of enable if, you can use requires, and there is a I think saying that that more, more constrained concepts it's it's a, it's a, it's it's the um, has more more priority. So this one will be selected if it's convertible. If not, this one will be selected. It's less typing, but still not that user friendly. The solution is to have explicit of bool here. That basically it will be an operator saying that if this is true, it will be explicit. If that's false, it's, it's implicit constructor. So you have to type it only once. And with concepts, it's even easier. So this is the feature. It helps a lot in writing those aggregates, or those, maybe not aggregates, those wrapper types. Another really important uh, stuff that, that, that changed in the, in the language mm, is that mm, we change the definition of, of integral types that are pretty basic to the language. Uh, what C11 says right now, C, not C++, says that the integer types are this sign magnitude, once complement, two complements. 
C++ has a bit different definition, but basically all of the modern computers work on two complements, are two complements machines. So there was a specification that they changed the boom, the, this to the science integers are two complements. Bool is either zero or, or one only. It cannot have d different bit set. And some other changes that you can find here. We'll not scope on this too much because we don't have much time. And I lost my timer here. <laughs> but I have another, another one to here too. Uh, Another breaking change, but really important change, is that we also provided some issues with C++11, again. We introduced UTF-8, 16, and 32 encodings. We introduced new character types, CAR16T, CAR32T, for UTF-16 and 32, but we left UTF-8 being defined in terms of regular character types. And if you have a character type string, you don't know if it's a UTF-8 or is it some, some ordinary character or literal string literal with, with the platform specific stuff. Uh, also, lack of the specific type for UTF prevents us to have good overload sets for, for functions working with different Unicode conversion uh, encoding standards. And a car also has this issue that it can be signed or unsigned. And, and you basically, it's a presentation defined how, how it works. So, let's see an example. If you write something like this, you know that's UTF-8. The code unique type is constar. And this is, these are the code unique values. If you write this, you know this is 16, this is 32. Those have the specific types. But if you write this and this, you don't know what's the encoding. If there are any code unique values, what does it mean? As we have the same type as I said used for UTF and, 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 and the platform strings, let's, let's call them, we, we have to provide different names for UTF-8. We cannot just say this is UTF-8, for example, or this is platform string and UTF-8 have, has its own type. Alias, of course, will not work here or type def, yes. Another issue is, for example, that we have file system path that takes, uh, for constructor, it has different uh, encodings possible. If it's uh, instantiated with, with 32T, it will be UTF-32 for UTF-16. But with CAR and WCHAR-T, it will be implementation-defined encoding, not UTF-8. So in order to construct the, the file system path with UTF-8, we have dedicated make functions standalone functions that, that, that create as, as the path with UTF-8. It's, it's, a, it's a design smell, yes. And also for call conversion stuff, there's a similar issue, but I will not go over this too much. Solution is that we are introducing new CAR8T type to the language. It has the same signatures, sign <laughs> size alignment integer conversion rank as unsigned car. It does not alias with any other type. Uh, UTF-8 string literals are changed from using constar star to use constar 8t star. And UTF character literal will be char 8t officially from now, now on. So there will be a lot of new specializations in the standard library for atomics, numeric limits, card trades, basic strings, for uh, operators, for streams, and many other places. Everything will work fine with this new type. But what bothers us is the backward compatibility issues. If you write something like this, this will compile fine in C++17. In 20, it will not compile. This is UTF encoding, and you say here that you're working with na native encoding, which is something different. If you say something like this, it will work. Uh, yeah, there is th th it will not work in 17 because there was no such type. And in 20, to be informed, you have to provide U8 at the beginning always. 
This will work fine for C17 and 20, so it's a bit inconsistent, but probably we didn't want to provide too many breaking changes in the code. And this one, of course, didn't exist in 17, but in 20 it means that it's always um, it's always UTF character. Implicit conversions. If you have here the constar array, then it was OK in C17. Right now it will be informed with pointers the same. With type deduction for templates, different types will be deduced when you instantiate them with U U8 uh, string literals. The same goes for auto. A virtual resolution for this will call different functions right now. Questions? Yes? Yeah. Yeah, my question was the, the two slides back, or mm -hmm. you assigned, <coughs> take one more back. Mm -hmm. you, uh, yeah, so char C is U8C. Yeah. Okay, so what happens if I, I mean, this works fine because it's in the, uh, the first 127, uh, 0 through 127. What mm -hmm. happens if I put like a line in one character which is higher than 127? Like, I don't know, like a. Uh, what, what is the value of C? Does it like do the, do the native character set conversion? Or what does it do if I have like an accent character in there instead of that C? Yeah, so the question is what will happen here in this case where we have um, UTF-8 character assigned to char C and what happens if it's outside of the character uh, size? It will probably over, 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 overflow, overflow, I mean overlap, yes? I don't know. I'm not the, the, the Unicode expert, sorry for this, but, 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 but probably and I would like to see here that it will be not working fine, it, it will be inf informed, but probably it could break too much code. We already are breaking a lot of code for you. So, so probably it was decided that this change is not that common in the code and it will, this with uh, basically using these st strings it's much more common than using specific the only one characters in the code. So probably it's not, it doesn't have that big, it's not that broken as it could be. So yeah, sorry, I didn't have a good, good, good answer for it. I don't like this exception too, but, but for character types, you can assign still UTF-8 to, to, to character and it will work fine. Actually, it, it works today, yes, and how it works? It will be working the same, exactly the same. It will be broken the same as it's broken right now. We didn't break anything more here. Yeah, uh, overall resolution. Different calls can, can, can be also, also here um, selected. Different template specializations may be selected. And yeah, also we were, uh, we also cleaned up the file system path constructors. Okay, I think that's, that's all for this feature. So basically, um, we should do this in C++11 and everything could be fine, yes? We are doing this, this eight years later or nine years later and this is, this is a problem because this should be from the very beginning in the standard. And this is this sets us a really good ground for, for next 20, 40, 50 years, but, but some code will be broken, unfortunately. But right now we are really starting to care about UTFs and Unicodes in the standard. We actually modified the, the official specification to, to follow the latest Unicode standards because it was some disaster in, in previous standards. So we, we actually are, right now we'll be using the latest Unicode standards in the C++ language and there are petitions right now in progress to provide new string type that will work fine with Unicodes. So I hope we'll see it for C++23. Zach Lane is working on this. And basically we have all of the Unicode study group. Yes? Okay. 
Mm -hmm. Yeah, so the question is uh, what to do with C17 in order to not, not, not provide more, more issues when C20 comes. I don't know what is the best guideline I, because we don't have. Um, what I would suggest maybe is creating an alias called car 8t and start using it with, with, with UTF 8 strings and then just removing this alias when 20 comes so your code is ready for it. It may be a solution to write a new code with UTF-8 right now that will be easy to progress to, to C20. Mm, okay, another small language feature is that we'll be able to um, nest inline spaces. Right now we can inline stud experimental in one line here, uh, sorry, nest stud ex experimental in stud in one line. You have to do write many lines here and many closing braces here. But if you have an inline line space, we had to separate them in separate lines. With C20, we'll be able to write them in one long line, which makes life or library vendors easier. Structure bindings, C17 feature. A structure binding is one of not many things that is a magic in C. Most of the things like, like uh, range based for loop, lambdas, are simple, let's say, code generators. But structure binding cannot be really expressed as a code generator. If you, there are a few attempts to, to, to specify how the code should look, but all of them saying this is not an actual reference, for example, because not, it's not in the reference type. It's something, it's, it's some alias, some name. And it, because of it, it behaves differently. You cannot say that, that these are static concepts. You cannot use maybe unused there, or you cannot capture them in, in lambda expressions. We are trying to make them feel similar to, to objects, to variables, but still there will be magic, of course. So the solution is that you'll be able to, they will have specific link, linkage, they will have, you'll be able to use them with external static, thread local, inline, consexp, you will be able to capture them in lambdas, use attributes on them. In C20. How many of you already had a problem with uh, implicit capture of lambda with equals for for classes like like capturing this instead of the uh, members you wanted to to capture and then the lifetime goes out and problems happen. This was one of the biggest feature issues with lambdas from C plus plus eleven. I think that Herbstatter tried to fix it in C plus plus fourteen, and basically a committee didn't agree for for it. So we decided that right now it's a good idea to do it. Five years, later, five years later, later, when we will be breaking even more code, so. So yeah, it's it's a bit strange, but we did a lot of changes actually to, to lambda capture here. It may break some code because some code will start to compile, but it's a it's, it's in a good fight. So you have to write equals and this if you would really like to capture this and some copies. It makes the lambda code much safer. But of course, this is of course some compatibility issues. Mm. It's a pity that we didn't do it in C plus plus fourteen or where we could, but still, it's good to have it. That's one of the biggest issues we have right now with with lifetime issues with lambdas. This is the original picture from proposal from the author. We had a lot of discussions about the span; it should be regular or not, and we, about the the sinuses of the of the size. So we are cleaning this up. Uh, span is a really strange type. Mm. This is the motivation, how the type should behave. If they are regular, then it should have spanning pointer semantics. If they are no regular, regular means that they are having default constructor and are copyable and movable and are having equality uh, comparison, if I remember correctly. So if they are not regular, they, they should provide a deep const. So, so if you have a const span, you, have, you, you, should, you could be able to, to modify the data pointed by span. If it's true, they, they also should have deep, deep assign. Otherwise, we have some strange state here. And we don't know exactly how to reason about such a type. This is also from this, is also from, from, from this proposal. Copy or copy not, there is no shallow. Int is a regular type. 
pointers are regular, span currently is not, but it basically works with those types. Right now, span has a shallow copy. So if you are copying two spans, you are not copying the memory pointed by the span. You're just copying the pointers to memory, yes? But if you compare them, it, make, it compares deeply. It just doesn't compare if the pointers are the same. It, it runs the equality comparison of, on the objects that are pointed by the pointers. And that's why it's all of this problem on, from, the, from, from the previous slide. And this is the same behavior actually what is for string views. But string views has, uh, are non-mutable and span is mutable. You can mutate actually the, 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 the data pointed by span. So this is different kind of view that string view is. And this basically may not work in most cases, especially in generic template code. For example, if you have a read-only function that takes something as a const, and then you have some temporary here of x, provide read-only x, and in, if it will happen that this t will be span, then this assert may not be true for span, because this read-only still may modify the contents in span, and then equality comparison will, will say that it's false after the copy, yes? And this actually should be always true for templated generic code. With string views, this is not an issue because you are not able to modify the string view, data pointed by string view. Another case here, you have a const span and you're doing copy of const span to some span If you will change the value of this span, you will change the value of const span, const span that you had const and the, 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 the copy, yes. It's another issue with span. It's a strange type. It was really useful for many cases. I'm pretty sure that, that, that guys that are doing mathem mathematical stuff with span will, will be using this a lot. I also probably will be using this a lot, but, but you have to be aware that this is a strange type. In order to make it less strange, we removed all of the comparison operators from span. You will not be able to compare two spans. If you would like to compare them, you have to do like, like stood, stood equal on the data pointed by span. So you basically always provide the means how you would like to compare them. If you want to compare pointers, you compare pointers in your, by hand, let's say, in your code. If you want to compare the values pointed by span, you compare the values. It's up to you to decide how you want to comp compare. Maybe at some point we'll find out some ultimate stuff how to do it, then you can add it again to span and not break anything. But right now we don't know how to do it properly. So it's better to, to leave this for the user code and not provide default or default. The, the library provided comparison operators for this type. Also, we made span look more similar to the containers. We added front, back, empty, as no discard. And we removed operator, a uh, call operator from it that was doing exactly the same as the braces operator here. And we added the support for uh, structure bindings to span. So it will be similar and, and drop in the ability replacement for, uh, for example, a C style array or stud array in the templated code. Yes, Arthur? Uh, since it's not equality comparable, does it mean that it's also not hashable? Mm, I'm not sure. Okay. I will have to, to, to find it out. Yeah. Span should be hashable. No, it shouldn't. It, should, yeah, it shouldn't. Yeah. Especially if you cannot compare it. I have to check. I have, I have to check it. In the standard. Yes. Yeah, but I mean, we have to we have to check if actually it doesn't have a hash specialization for span. Can you check it? We can do that. Yeah. Yeah. Great, thank you. So the comment was: if you cannot equally compare it, you cannot use it for a, for a hash table for, as a key because you cannot compare stuff. So basically, it shouldn't be hashable too. The user has to provide its own hasher 
in order to compare the same way as the comparison operator is doing. Another problem and discussion was what's the ultimate type for size in containers? We spent like three meetings and we had three discussions and every time we had different results from it, depending which group was discussing about it. And we cannot agree still what's the best, best, best solution here. And the, prob the problem arises when we started to standardize span. We said, let's start going good new path. Let's make the size, the signed, signed type. We have an author of the proposal here too. And then uh, that was of this proposal actually, I think. So basically we tried to set up new path. Let's, from now on, let's do the right stuff. Let's make the size, the, uh, the signed integer because it's faster, it's better. We shouldn't use unsigned but all of other stuff are using unsigned. So basically we say size type should be signed, but then you have write a code like this, where you compare with size of, and you have, well, as again, warning from the compiler. So maybe size type should be unsigned. Then you're writing for int e equals zero, int i equals zero and compare it to the container size. And you have once again the warning. So what's the ultimate solution for this one? I really think that at some point all of the containers should have the, the signed, side, signed size, but maybe you should move all of the containers at the same, at the same time to, 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 to this step. <laughs> because we know that the, that the unsigned is slower and it makes our code slower. So the solution is to switch span again or, or to be consistent with the rest of the, com of the rest of the library to use the unsigned type for size but also we provided non-member function as size that provides us the signed size for every container it's a template function non-member function so you can basically use it with every, any container here so if you write as size of the container you have a signed size you will not have problems with this warning here anymore so this is the solution for C++ 20. You said all containers or just every? Uh, with every container because it's a template function. Oh, oh it's a So basically it will call size and cast it to, it, it cast it to the sign type. Mm -hmm. So you don't have to cast it by yourself. I mean every container that has size member function or, or works with stood size, yes? Mm -hmm. Okay, mm, another, yes, Jeff? So I think for clarification, is I, I do not see the hash function in both Kona work and Graph, so. Right. Okay, so the clarification from Jeff is here is about the, this hashing of span, that there is no right now hash defined for, specialization defined for, for span. So it's fine and we are good, okay. Okay, another proposal is to change uh, how we, and uh, verify if an element exists in, in a container, especially associative ones here. Right now you have to run things like this. If you have to do find and then basically compare it to the, to the end every time. A lot of people complained about it. It pr produces excessive boilerplate. Not clearly expressed what we meant. So it's not obvious to beginners, for example. And if you try to use, for example, count for multi-set, multi-map, it will not be optimal. So the solution is to add new member function to containers called contains, and it will exactly do what, what you meant. So we added more member functions to, to big containers, or, but they are already big anymore, already so. Yeah, my personal opinion is that we should write those as non-member functions, as a temp temp template functions, not grow our containers even more. But, but yeah, this is, this is how it was added to C++20. Do you know why we didn't use that? Uh, for consistency, because uh, containers already have, have a lot of functions like this. If, if only one or two will be, will be non-member, it will be harder to use, probably. I would prefer right now, if you would be probably working with writing to two, probably will be doing this totally different. All of the functions will be non-member and those containers will not have them. String will have like 30 member functions instead of 200. 
<coughs> and, and, and then it would be much easier to, to work and, and write new code. Right now, if you would like to, to write a new string that is a different string, but, but want to have the same interface as library, you have to write like 200 overloads. It's really broken, in my opinion. It should be, most of this should be non-member functions, but we cannot fix it for, st for, st for standard, actual standard library. And two, two will never happen, so at least in many, many years, we kill this. Yeah, so the, so the content is that using, using usability, so if you write a dot or a, on an arrow, it provides you the member functions. But this basically if you're writing things with VI or, 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 or Emacs. <laughs> a lot of IDEs already can, can, can work with and provide you non-member functions also after uh, and help you with that. So I think that's, that's not the major, major problem here. We, I, mean, I think that member functions for, for all of these containers are, are wrong and we are just making it harder and encapsulation actually is, is worse than, than better with every new function. There's a really, really nice article from Scott Myers many years ago on this. But let's continue, we have really 30 minutes and 50 slides. <laughs> so I will not be able to go through all of this if you have more, many questions. Uh, we have two proposals for heterogeneous lookup for another, another containers. Actually those containers were written by me and my company. So I had to put them here. Um, for unordered containers, right now, uh, if you want to, for example, look for keys for with, with C style strings or with string views, every time we'll have to create a string. Sometimes also do allocations if those strings are bigger than, than small string optimizations, yes? So it's not effective from performance point of view. The solution for it is that our hasher that we provide will have to provide transparent key equal with a, a, a comparator to use for, for equality comparison. And then our hasher will have overloads of collaborator for every type we would like to use for our mm, hashing and comparison stuff. I use exactly the same implementation for string view in all cases, so I know that, that all, of the, all of the values are exactly the same, they are consistent. And with this, I can define my another map having string, int, and string hash that I just provided here, I don't have to provide a quality operator here because it's defined here. This is how, C so how the LEWG wanted this feature. My initial proposal was a bit different. And with that, if you write just ABC or a string view, you will never, you will never pay for temporary stood string being created. You will never pay for allocation. It will be much, much faster. In my uh, domain, when I'm working with, with low latency software for finance, it made a lot of difference in performance, really a lot. Another proposal that we proposed to stand, to, uh, my company proposed to the to the standard, is uh, regarding um, also lookup functions in case where you are having uh, the same key stored in many containers, like you have I don't know a library with books and users, and you would like and you have li li like the uh, the hash map, let's say, for the books and which users with history of users that were, for example, renting it. So if you want to verify then in, in different order, which, uh, for example, um, which books the user has right now, you have to look for the same user in all of the books, in all of the, all of the, all of the hash maps. So if you have an array of unordered maps, with strings and integers here, uh, called, called maps. And then, right now, if you want to find some user, um, right now you have to uh, basically recalculate hash value every time for the same string of the user. Yes? With the feature, you will be able to provide hash as a second parameter to the find function and we'll be reusing the same value for all of the, comp all of the operations here. But of course, you have to make sure that all of the containers, or all of the, all of the um, containers hash maps stored in this array has the same hasher, so the, so the value is, is, is valid for all of these instances. This also saved like 
20 or 30 percent of our performance if we, in such lookups. So basically, you don't have to recalculate hash every time for the same type in such in such cases. Erase. We added erase if and erase non uh, member functions, function templates for every container actually, not only for vector. So it will work fine and you'll be able to erase things. You don't have to do um, uh, how it's called. Mm. Yeah, re re remove, re re yeah, erase, erase, remove is idiom anymore. You will just use erase and it will be working fine for everything, for list, vector, map, everything. Um, okay, talking about the algorithms, uh, we added new execution policy for algorithms. It's called unsequenced policy and, and the keyword for it is unsec. It's similar to what we had right now because right now we had par unsec, which means that it's a parallel execution and vectorized. And right now we allow the, the policy to have vectorization without parallelization. So, so th this, is, this is pretty important for, for, for performance. And this will be in C20. We had a shift algorithm. Because right now you could write shift by yourself, but it's suboptimal. So there, there will be the dedicated shift left, shift right algorithm. Uh, both for, for the execution policy and, 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 and without it. We made um, return types of erase functions or remove functions from the containers consistent because, for example, right now map has a size type and list has void for similar functions doing similar stuff. It's still strange that it's called erase and remove, but, but at least return types will be the same. So basically, in all the remove, remove if, unique member of the forward list, list, and we we'll use container size as a, as a return type. We added new utilities for, for power of two operations. So we will have is power of two, floor two, uh, seal two, and, and logarithmic power of two. We have a bit cast. Bitcast is a new type of casting. It's a bit like memcopy, um, a bit like reinterpret cast, but safer. Basically, you, if you want to cast one type to another, you can do reinterpret cast, but you can have problems with type aliasing rules. Um, Bitcasting doesn't have those issues. You could, of course, you use align storage and do memcopy for those, but it's it's hard to do and no, and not many people can do it properly and because of it, non, it's not being used often. Uh, when we were back, back, shed, back shedding this name, we had different possibilities here. We wanted to name it Bitcast, Memorycast, and also Podcast. <laughs> it's, it, it nearly went through. But yeah, it, it's left as Bitcast. It's working only if the size of both arguments, template arguments, is the same. If both of them are trivially copyable. And basically, it copies one object to another, similar to what you will be using with memcopy, but actually it can work in context context, and memcopy cannot. So it's much fast, it's, it's really fast and, and, and really robust. So don't do reinterpret cast for this from C20. Mm. This is about atomic compare exchange. If you are comparing two objects that has padding inside, it basically behaves like you would be comparing the memory of it together with padding stuff. And we all know that padding can be different for different objects of the same type. So basically atomic compare exchange strong was broken because of it. And two objects, even copy of, those, of the same objects could, have, could not be compared equal sometimes. So the solution is that, that, that right now it will be used value representation instead of the, if, instead of the uh, uh, memory representation. Padding bits will be ignored. And in case of unions, in case of unions you may have still some problems. 
if, you, if, the, if the size of the union members are different. Um, another change is about the uh, atomic stuff. Right now we have, we have atomic of T for many, for many things, but those are like, like mostly fundamental types and some, and some other simple types, but, but user cannot easily write an atomic operation for it. You have, we, have, we have to write our own wrappers ar around our type to, in order to make sure that all of the operations we do are atomic. So, the solution that will be from C++, in library forms from C20, that would be a new type called atomic ref, not just atomic. It means it's a reference type. We provide a pointer to it. So, this is a pointer to our own type. And with this, our operations will be atomic on those, on, on those types. There, there will, of course, not be log free, it will do logs for us. And the requirement that T has to be trivially copyable. And he provided the uh, interface similar to atomic of T, of course. Integral and floating point types have specializations and pointers have partial specializations already for this, for this atomic ref uh, helper here. It should help us to write um, atomic operations for any type, user-specified type, easily. And we, have, we don't have to reinvent this type any, anymore in our libraries. Yes, Jeff? I think so, that, yeah. The question is, does it mean that there will be a mutex? I think that it, there will be a mutex. But if you'll be writing this for your own type, you will, you will be doing mutex and anyway. I wrote like two or three such, such, such types already for, for my different using libraries and clients. It's good to have it in my library. Yes, Arthur? No, I hope you will not ask about it. <laughs> <laughs> and this was specified in the paper. I don't know what not, not address free means. I'm not the expert from in, in, in this domain, sorry. Uh, and the comment was that, that, that it may be done not like without logs, but I think that the generic primary template implementation always has logs. You can provide your own specialization for your own pointer types and provide no logs for them if you know that they are log-free log and then do log-free implementation for those. But I think the generic implementation will always make, make logs in New Texas. Yes, question? So when you try to access this type, it will lock and after the access you will read the unlock. Yes, I, I think so, yeah. Uh, there's a question if it's possible to hold the log between two operations on the same type. I don't think so. Maybe you can then do atomic ref of, of atomic ref and ah. make two operations. <laughs> I don't know. Why is this atomic ref of T star instead of just atomic ref of T? Uh, because this is a reference type. So, 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 we want to make, so, so we want to have reference semantics. So that's why we're taking the, the pointer instead of the, the type. I think that's, that, that's, that, that's the reason. So you know that you're working, with the, the, this is a view. If you're providing T, it will, could, people would, would think that this, this, this has ownership. If you provide a, a, a pointer, you know ex exactly always that you are working with view. So maybe this was the, the, the design intent here. Yes? As I understand, whatever is in blue is a link? No, this is not link. This is for me to, to, to provide the presentation easier and for you to read it faster. But the proposal? Yeah, pr proposals are links. Yeah, you can see this is a link. But, but everything written in blue here is, is basically to, to highlight the most important stuff for me to provide the presentation for you and for you to read it faster because we really don't have time to read 200 slides with, in detail today. So these are like highlights of the, of the code. But yeah, all the proposals are, are with links and you can basically use this wg21.link WG tool because this is exactly what this is using. Um, there is a pattern that constructors having one parameter should be explicit, yes? But there's also a pattern where we provide the, those one single argument constructors, those arguments have default values. So it means when you're using them as a default constructors, 
using so reusing default values, they are still explicit. And having explicit default constructors is wrong in many cases. So in this case, it will not compile fine because this uh, structure having string and QE will initialize string and QE will not be initialized with default constructor because it's explicit default constructor in this case. So we have to write empty braces here or, or QE default constructor explicitly every time you wrote, we want to write it. And so this is not a deep, deep good design mm, feature. And we switch those to, se to, se to two separate uh, constructors, one with, with default constructor without any arguments and one explicit with one argument. And all of the library was cleaned up for, for that. Um, this is the area for change probably also for, for later uh, standards because we're still discussing uh, probably most of the constructors we have in our library should be explicit. I, don't, I mean, no, no default constructor, but all of them having even two, three or four arguments still should be explicit, probably. And we are thinking about adding those at some point, but probably we'll be doing like for all of the types in the library at some point. It will make everything much safer. Variant converting constructor. Uh, variants are great, I use them a lot, but they can have some uh, surprising results sometimes. For example, if you write string and bool and provide such stuff to it, it will select bool. Uh, if you have a character and having optional char 16t and provide utf 16 string, it will call have character here. If you have a double here, and provide it to reference wrapper of double, it will store int. If you have a variant of float and int, st, and you will assign zero, it will switch from float that was selected during default constructor to int. Even though, yeah, zero is an literal, and probably you, you, meant just, you just wanted to, to, to clear the, the float you have there. But if you're having the same type, mm, uh, while having float and long, I would like to assign zero, you have a compile time error. It, was don't, it still don't want to select float for you. If you have variant of float and big int, and you assign zero, actually it will select float. So uh, all of this was, uh, so converting constructors and converting operators were fixed uh, to work with those, to prevent narrowing conversions and conversion to bool in C++20. So you will have what you expect from the code. Talking about the variant, there is also a helper saying that visit function will be able to provide you the return type of the, of the visitation as a template parameter. For example, if you have here a uh, process, that will be a visit visitor for our variant that works with any uh, with, with any um, member of the variant and the type of the variant and just returns you the output of the variant in a, in a temp class template. You had, you had always to write it here in, um, in the visitor instead of saying that it can, it's here in the, in, the var in the visitor. With C++20, you'll be able to write this code. Uh, hmm. Where is it? Here, saying that you can, you, you'll be able, yeah, basically here you had to, to fix one of those specific solutions. You cannot use different stuff with the same, with the same visitor. So may, for example, you may want to have variant uh, of, of, old, of first element and second element here returns from this process. You may want to have common type of those two. Or you may just want to, to return nothing from it. You can easily right now say it in during calling visit function here rather than fixing it here for, for everything. Uh, 
Another nice feature is Asim Aligned. Uh, you know how uh, for loops works. If you have a big um, array of, 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 of data, like integers, and you would like to, to, to work with vectorization stuff on this, uh, it will just work on the vectorization, let's say, offsets, alignment. So at the beginning, you have some preamble, doing regular for, uh, like, like, like operations on specific integers. Then when the offset is reached, it will start vectorization. And then there will, there will be the padding also processed in, in the third step. So with this a feature, you are able to, to make this uh, for loop vectorized in a way that you would say that I know that my data is aligned to the vectorization address, so don't generate code for this first, sta first stage for it. And then CMD will work fine for it. The solution is assume aligned a template function. And basically, it just takes a pointer and returns it unchanged. It doesn't do anything. It's a it's an information for the compiler to know that, that this type is aligned. And you are using this in this way. You are saying that our x here is aligned. You store it as a different pointer and using this pointer here in the loop. And right now, the compiler will generate different code for you. Much more optimal code for, for this case. But of course, if your code will not be aligned, then you have problems, yes? Creation of arrays with, with make unique. Do you know what is the difference between those two uh, code snippets? We have here uh, allocation of the array with new, and then we are assigning values and returning a pointer to created, to created array. So this is like a make function, like, like a factory function. Doing the same unique pointer seems pretty similar. The difference is that in this stage, all of the values in the array will be default initialized. Sorry, value initialized. So you will we'll put zeros here just to write new proper values here in the next step. So it's, it's some overhead. This is for make unique, make shared, allocate shared. So in C++20, we have overloads for, for um, arrays and for types that are not arrays that will not do default initialization. Sorry, it will not do value initialization, it will do default initialization. Default initialization for fundamental types, we are not doing anything. So it may be misleading name, but this is actually the term that default initialization for fundamental types is not doing anything. So, so I hope it will be used properly. There was some concerns in the committee if it's a good name, but it's actual the best name probably because this is the actual term used for default initialization. Uh, we have six minutes left, so uh, we can just move quickly through the code or, or maybe go with questions if you have, probably, because the next features will be less and less important. So it is not that important to go through them. And I don't know if you should go through, through, through them really quickly because in six minutes we'll not cover 20 slides, probably. So maybe I will just highlight you what, what, what is this and if you are interested, just write or remember the number and read about it uh, later on. It, there will be slides, of course, after the, after the training. Mm, actually, actually, right now, the standard, the, uh, C in operator, so, so each team operator does not protect against buffer overflow for pointers. That's why we, we switch from pointers to the unbounded and bounded arrays overloads. Uh, this is a great, great type. Uh, this is the replacement of our std bind called bind front. It fixes a lot of issues with std bind. Um, I will not go through all those cases. All of this is, is, is described in detail in the paper. So, so if you're interested, go to the paper and, and, and refer to it. Uh, actually, it makes things less verbose, which is, which is good. What it does, maybe, what it does is basically it's like a bind, but only binds for, for, for the first n arguments. You cannot reorder them, you cannot repeat them. So you don't have those underscore one, underscore two, 
things that you say how, how to order them or, or which, things, which things you are binding, you are doing bind front, saying you're binding from the front this many arguments. It's less verbose in this case. It propagates mutability properly. It preserves the return value, return type correctly here. And it, preview, it also preserves value category properly. And you can write it, for example, for the um, error value ref specifier. So it will be on, support only one shot invocation, which will not work with uh, either with lambda or bind properly. We have some changes for allocation stuff, for allocators. Um, we would like to start using allocators for types that are not templates. So basically we, we are we, like containers. Mm, in order to use this, those types will have to provide allocator type as a nested type in, in, in their interface. So you have to have this using a public, public using saying allocator type is specific allocator. And there will be final stuff looking in your type it, it, if it has this type def, and if it has it, it will work fine. Also, it will detect it in a constructor list if it's the last argument of the constructor. So it will help us in this case. And yeah. And, this will, and there are some helper functions like make object using allocator t. So you'll be able to, to then uh, create those objects using specific allocator provided to, end, to a wrapper type. There will be a lot of functions for that, a lot of overloads, depending on the, on the usage, including even piecewise construct. And there are some helper functions, make object using allocator and initialize construct using allocator. Another big, big, uh, big um, feature that was added in on last meeting in Kona, it was also a bit controversial uh, during the voting, is using polymorphic allocator as a vocabulary type. So it's not a template parameter. It will be used for just constructor of the non-template non -template classes, so regular classes. For example, if you have some int vector, you know that it's a vector over ints, and it has size capacity and, and pointer, like a well-behaved vector should have, you cannot easily specify how to allocate this, this data, because it's not a template, and you don't want a template here. You can, of course, create a template but it makes your code longer and harder to, to implement. Mm. Or you can use memory resource already in the standard, but it's not easy, the easiest way to, to, to do it. So with the solution, you'll be able to use a, well, a solution, a polymorphic allocator uh, that's extended to some new member functions here. And, okay, I, I don't see it, okay. Probably this should, this should be also solution, not motivation, sorry. And you basically will be just saying that it has public member call, called allocator type. It will be polymorphic allocator. It will have this allocator type being used as the last parameter, parameter of the constructor. And everything will be just work fine. All the allocators, all the, all the allocations will be controlled by the, all of the uh, standard library machinery for, 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 for the allocation stuff without having your type, type being a template type, template class, class template. And probably the last feature are the um, interpolation of numbers and pointers. It's not that easy like this. It has, this display dash has a lot of issues. It can, it can overflow. This one also is not, not, not the best one. It can also have some problems. This one too. Uh, it, so it seems that it's, it's, it looks like a simple feature, but it's really hard to write it correctly. That's why, that's why there will be a, a function called midpoint in the standard library that will be doing this correctly for everyone. So we don't have to reinvent it and do it in the wrong way. 
there will be also um, interpolation for any point in the in the range. And with this, uh, this is the last slide. So basically, these are the next meetings and the plan for C20. There are still some proposals ongoing, for example, stood format to, to format strings. We will not be able to we will not be forced to, to go to printf and S and S and printf anymore from starting from C20. It's great. We have some more proposals being still in the process, and we hope to finish them in colon. Then we'll have uh, comments from national bodies, and we'll have to fix them. Uh, we hope to release the current C20 version in 2020, and in a year from now, we'll start working on C23. Yes, Jeff? So, given what you covered today, I'll note that my presentation tomorrow was going to cover some of those things that you just mentioned that are still in flight, like FMT um, and, and some of the other features. And based on what you presented here, I'm going to cut a few things out. So, um, that's a plug. Okay, so the comment from Jeff is that, that we had some some um, collision of the of, of, of the scope here, but it will make probably the life of Jeff easier because he will have less material to talk, have more time for it. Yes, so thank you. <laughs> and, and you will have but, but, but better information on this. And also we'll be talking about stud format tomorrow. Regarding the yes. uh, representation of signed integers as two complement, can you remind the status of that? Is it still considered or it's definitely will be in play? It's already in the paper. So it will be? It, yeah. Cool. Thanks. Sure. Okay, if you have any other questions that you would like to work, come and see your other part of the slides, uh, reach me on the break or you will find all of the slides in later on uh, distributed with, with, with the conference because I will distribute both option A and option B with the slides for this. Thank you very much for coming and see you next time.